Good afternoon. I'm just going to lower this because I'm short. <laughs> Welcome to the University of Victoria and to the Faculty of Fine Arts, and even more specifically to the Bishop Theater in our wonderful Department of Theater. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alana Lindgren. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Fine Arts here at the University of Victoria, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's Orion Lecture, which will be given by Dr. Patricia Bovey. I would like to acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. As many of you know, Dr. Bovey has had a long and distinguished career in the arts. So please relax, this is going to be <laughs> a, lengthy, uh, a lengthy introduction, but actually quite truncated in terms of all of Dr. Bovey's accomplishments. But um, we are so lucky and blessed to have her on our side in the arts. Commencing her art gallery career in 1970 as curator of the Winnipeg Art Gallery, Dr. Bovey was also director of the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria here in Victoria from 1980 to 1999. And then she returned as gallery, director of the Winnipeg Art Gallery from 1999 to 2004. She's also the founding director curator of the St. Boniface Hospital's Bueller Gallery. She has served as an adjunct professor of public administration here at the University of Victoria, and also as an adjunct professor of art history at the University of Winnipeg. Dr. Bovey was a member of the Senate of Canada from 2016 to 2023. As senator, she served on many Senate committees, including serving as the chair of the Senate Artwork and Heritage Advisory Working Group. In the Senate, she gave voice to the importance of the arts throughout society, initially in initiating special Senate exhibitions, programs, reports, and legislation. The Senate, thanks to Dr. Bovey, unanimously passed a bill, the Parliamentary Visual Arts Laureate, and the Declaration Respecting the Essential Role of Artists and Creative Expression in Canada and adopted the Senate report she initiated entitled Cultural Diplomacy at the Center of Canada's Foreign Policy. Her internal Senate work included contracting an external ana uh, analysis of the Senate's Indigenous art collection and initiating programs such as honoring Canada's black artists, galleries and museums in the Senate, and cultivating perspectives in which Canadian curators were invited to publish on aspects of the Senate's collection. She is the former chair of the board of the former chair of the Board of Governors of the University of Manitoba and board chair of the Emily of Emily Carr University. She's also served on the National Gallery of Canada's Board of Trustees, the Board of the Canada Council for the Arts, just to name a few. She's also past chair of the Canadian Museum Directors Organization. Dr. Bovey received a University of Manitoba Honorary Doctor of Laws in 2021. Additionally, she's a fellow of the UK's Royal Society of the Arts, a fellow of the Canadian Museums Association, and she's a recipient of the Canada 125 Medal, the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal, Winnipeg's Women of Distinction for the Arts, the Canadian Museums Association Award of Distinguished Service, the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts Medal, the Association of Manitoba's Museum Inaugural Award of Merit, and the Winnipeg Art Council's Making a Difference Award. In 2023, she was given the distinction as the first honorary member of Canadian Black Artists United, and was also honored as Kingston, Ontario's H. Art, Heart <laughs> Center, inaugural champion of inclusive arts. She's a member of Ghana's Pan-African Heritage Museum's International Curatorial Council, and was recently appointed the Pan-African Heritage Museum's Special Museum Ambassador. 
We're very lucky to have her with us today. Please welcome Dr. Patricia Bovey. Thank you, Alana. Um, I'm not sure, did I do that? <laughs> you never, you always wonder um, if it's really you that somebody's talking about, and, and uh, you're very kind. Thank you very, very much. And it's a real honor to be here today, and a particular honor to see people who are willing to come out on a Friday afternoon. So I thank you in this wonderful weather to, to, to take time and, and uh, see some of what we're, we're up to. So thank you for the introduction. Thank you for this wonderful invitation. And I want to say that I truly believe that this university is doing groundbreaking work, and I commend you. And uh, I want to say that uh, both my daughters are graduates of the University of Victoria, and you've heard uh, some of my connections with the university. I guess the most recent being a few years ago when I had the privilege of curating the Mafan Republic exhibition for the Legacy Gallery. So uh, uh, my, con my connections have carried on in a funny sort of way uh, since uh, in the last number of years I've lived elsewhere. I want to um, uh, applaud everybody, artists, curators, writers, collectors, galleries, museums, who have been diligent and uh, diligently committed to the creation, preservation and presentation of visual art, collectively building Canada's visual legacy, and particularly that of this part of Canada. Arts and culture are our soul, and work in heritage and public trust is really important for here, for the province, and for Canada. In beginning, I want to say I owe a personal thanks to the Kwakwakwiak Nation Hunt family of Fort Rupert, who adopted me in a special ceremony as an honorary family member almost 30 years ago in April 1994. I hold that honor with very real pride. I also want to acknowledge Val Vint, Manitoba Indigenous artist and knowledge keeper, who hosted my First Nations Prairie Focus Group, which accorded me permission to write about the work of Prairie Indigenous artists. I am now from Treaty 1, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the national homeland of the Red River Métis. And I appreciate the land acknowledgement uh, that uh, you have just given, Alana. It just shows how our, our, our First Nations people in this country come together and have been together. Art has always, in my view, reflected society, its customs, cultures, and sense of place frequently infusing the spiritual into the visual dialogue. And it's been a mirror for many crises and societal issues, drawing attention to well-known concerns and those communities which have not yet been recognized. Western Canadian artists have alerted society to the realities of increasing poverty, inner city homelessness, the lack of safe water in Northern indigenous communities, residential schools, post-colonial injustices, and the many unresolved cases of missing and murdered women and indigenous women and girls, not to mention other concerns that are related and link into those. Artists' insights into societal concerns over decades are critical. Western Voices in Canadian Art is dedicated to artists whose visual acuity inspires and enriches society, allowing us to see, think, engage, past and present, indigenous and non-indigenous, those born here and those who immigrated from all around the globe. The resulting rich fabric of visual expression in Western Canada has contributed substantially to our national oeuvre in ways often not recognized, but which certainly deserve to be celebrated. Much groundbreaking art in all media has been created in our four Western provinces, spelling new directions for Canadian art as a whole. A Little bit about this book. It was born in a very heady time. The spring of 1970, when preeminent Canadian art historian Russell Harper told me that I was going to write about Western Canadian art. I was a very, very young curator. Well, 
The intervening years have been rich for me with engagements with artists in their studios, at exhibitions, on the phone, on Zoom, in letters, email, and these studio visits have been an important ballast for me throughout my career. And I want to say very clearly that artists' visual and verbal insights, past and present, have been truly grounding and inspirational to me. My views have come from years of looking at art and the many penetrating and significant conversations I have had with artists. So the diversity of art from the West includes extraordinary work by First Nations and Métis artists, Blackfoot Cree, Anishinaabe, Oji Cree, Haida Kwakwakwaok, Coast Salish, to name but some. Pre- and post-World War II immigrants from around the globe have added immeasurably. First to fifth generation Canadians are core to our visual story, as are artists who left the West to travel, to study, and live elsewhere, and they returned with new perspectives which have enhanced the art of the region and thus the art of our nation. In 1946, John Hatch Jr. of the Albany Institute of Art and History in New York wrote, and I quote, the study of Canadian art history is still in its infancy. The span of Canadian art is far greater than that in our country, the US. One suspects, however, that in proportion of artists to the population, Canada might be found to lead. Certainly, the quality of the work produced merits Canadian artists more serious consideration and study by the people in the United States than they have received in the past. I've been truly humbled and honored by the uh, interest in this book, and I thank everybody who's shown it. And I've had the privilege of speaking in a number of places, a number of cities, universities, and art galleries. And I want to say that every place has asked for a different aspect of the book and a different topic. So um, my work has been uh, extended, for which I'm very grateful. And today, my focus is the land, culture, and reconciliation, reflecting the power and substance of Indigenous art, First Nations, and Métis from the West. I chose this rather complex topic because in its complexity, it reveals our truth as to who we are, where we live, and how we adapt. To reach the collaborative societal goal of reconciliation, I believe we need multiple reconcili actions. And I know that's not a word, but it is for me now. The core of these reconcili actions must be the understanding of the land and the meaning of culture. Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner, the Honorable Murray Sinclair, my friend and Senate colleague, he brought me into the Senate when I was sworn in. I asked him to. For many years that we overlapped in the chamber, he sat behind me. And as I was supportive whenever he was speaking about needs of Indigenous communities, I have to say he was very supportive whenever I spoke about visual art as a pillar of culture. At the recent swearing in of Manitoba's new Premier, Wab Kanu, and his cabinet, Wab Kanu being our first First Nations Premier, Murray Sinclair noted Manitoba's the, that noted that Manitoba's elections outcome was a big step towards reconciliation. Alberta First Nations artist Terence Houle aptly said to me of the concept of boundaries, geographical boundaries, he said, Pat, we don't have geographical boundaries, end quote, nor do the ideas and impacts of Western arts works. So briefly, this book, its first half, is the chronological development of the expression, visual expression in Western Canada, and a summary development of galleries, schools of art, and volunteerism in the arts. It spans from seven, the 1780s to the present, contextualizing major events, issues, and the wider environment within which artists worked, and the new materials and media in which they worked. And I want to say right at the outset, there are people who should be in this book and aren't, and there are parts of what I wrote that I'm very sorry didn't make it into the final cut of the book. I just might end up doing a series of articles that I might call Western Voices and Canadian Art Extended. Um, uh, and I have to say, not all those decisions of cutting out what I wanted in here were mine. So I'm not gonna take full responsibility. Uh, the designer and the publisher, we had long debates and um, we got, 
we got in as much as we could, and I'm very grateful to the University of Manitoba Press, who gave over 400 pages and over 260 images. And I hope we've cracked the surface so that much more work will be done and much more will be written. So let me just, I'm just quickly going to show you some of those early pieces, just to get a sense of the landscape. The one on the left excited me tremendously. Uh, it, it was by, it's, it's by um, George Dixon. I found it in a book that my deceased archival husband had. And I was so excited when I found this little one of, of um, uh, a view of Hippa Island, Queen Charlotte Isles, 1788. And you can see the First Nations uh, boat in, in, the, in, the, at, in the foreground. I was so excited, I phoned a friend. I said, you got to come over for coffee. Look what I found. And she came in. She took one look at it, and she said, I'm leaving. I said, what do you mean you're leaving? What have I said? Coffee's on. She said, I'll be back. She came back with George Dixon's journal. So the book has the image and his writing about this particular site and event. Turns out, George Dixon is her ancestor. And we all know about the Dixon, we know about um, uh, Dixon Strait, named after him. And we know about the Mason-Dixon line, named after him. And then when I take a look at the landscape and, 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 and the early interactions uh, with, with um, uh, non-Indigenous artists with Indigenous peoples, uh, Peter Rindisbacher arrived in Hudson's Bay with his family, Swiss family, uh, in 1821. And he was the first professionally trained artist to live in the West. He was in Red River for 1821 to 1826. Um, the unfortunate thing for them was uh, that they thought they were landing in New Orleans, and instead they landed in Hudson's Bay. So it was a little bit of a different uh, landscape, but snow was not new to him. The North American bison was new to him, and certainly were indigenous peoples. And he, too, writes about very, very uh, fond events with First Nations. So as we look at some other landscape artists, an understanding of the land around us. We have two members of the group of seven, Franz Johnston, Serenity Lake of the Woods. He was principal of the Winnipeg School of Art for four years. And we have Fred Varley uh, painting Dawn uh, three years after he arrived in Vancouver to work at the Vancouver uh, School of Art. And I think you get a sense in these of a, the sense of the spirit of place, which is why I wanted to, to show these works. Uh, and uh, Terry, I didn't know you were coming today. It's really glad you're here. Um, so Tak Tanabi and Terry Fenton, I bring these, these to you as well because I really, sent in both of these, get a real sense of that distance and the light and the sense of place. And, uh, and, and I, I love the, 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 the smoothness of the application of paint and the understanding of place. Now I'm going to move very quickly into um, uh, some of the beginning of the abstracted, almost spiritual sense of, of the land. And I'm concentrating on this because in my years of teaching, I used to ask my students, what does the word culture mean? And the years I had indigenous students in my class, quick as a flash, I'd hear the word land. The land. Culture meant land. The land gave food, shelter, tools, challenges, and comfort. And I believe, as I said, landscape also spoke spiritually and was the essence of culture for all people, but those who understood it best were the First Nations peoples. And uh, uh, in, in Honora Brown, an Alberta artist, I love the way she's got the, the, the geometric of the... Of the um, uh, the uh, fields and the geometrics, uh, uh, shapes of the grain elevators, and look how the shafts of light come down from the, from, from the sky across those plains to give that sense. And Luke Lindo, by the way, who was the one who got uh, Walter Dexter in interested and encouraged him to take ceramics. Luke Lindo's wonderful swirl in space, I thought, is, I, th I think that's a, an important piece, as is George Swinton the birth of a prairie river. So I'm not going to get into these now. I'm going to be working on George Swinton, and another book will be forthcoming. But you all know Norman Yates, who moved here, retired here from um, Alberta. This is a detail of a work. And I brought this in because his canvases were never big enough. And he kept adding, he kept adding sections to it and called them land spaces. 
But I now want to um, start moving, uh, moving into uh, a deeper discussion of First Nations work. You all know Alex Jean Vier, who was a member of the uh, Indigenous Group of Seven. Uh, his magnificent exhibition a few years ago at the National Gallery of Canada was amazing. And this piece that he did in 2008 called Manitoba, uh, I think gives a sense of an aerial view of the importance of water, the importance of space, and the sensibility of the confluence of the two rivers. Artists have been clairvoyant on so many issues, the environment and climate change, health, and, and we had a wonderful discussion about that uh, yesterday, uh, health and human rights, self-rule and colonialism, residential schools and reconciliation, and we touched on some of that this morning, war and conflict, and in the second half of this book, I take a look at these themes as, as, as um, developed by, by artists. And I examine them from multiple perspectives, multiple times, uh, multiple ages, uh, and uh, geographical regions at the same time. Um, I contend that Emily Carr was one of the early uh, artists to um, draw attention to the devastation of the clear cuts. But now let's, let me turn to key issues starting with health and human rights. And Rebecca Belmore was a very real visual leader and I think this work called Trace, which is in the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, is a really important one. It's a multi-story installation. It hangs like a towel on the back of a hook, on the back of a bathroom wall door, or like a blanket on a peg, suggesting, you know, we wrap ourselves in a blanket when we're wet and cold getting out of the shower, or we wrap ourselves, it's a, wrap ourselves in a towel when you come out of the shower. We wrap ourselves in, a, in, a, in, in the winter to keep warm but that's not what this is about. It's about the simultaneous, she simultaneously symbolizes the smallpox spread through the Hudson's Bay blankets, which devastated First Nations communities across this country, almost wiping out the, the, um, the Haida. What's remarkable about this work is the clay beads, as they are, you've got a detail there, were made in public events. Uh, everybody came and they squished the Red River mud into the clay beads which formed this piece. And the wide engagement in its creation signifies the number of people in her mind who died of European disease and is hanging through four stories of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, epitomizes the extent and reach of that impact. First Nations artist in, in Saskatchewan, Ruth Cuthand, I think has done these the, she, since 2008. <clears throat> She's been uh, also bringing devastation of disease to the fore. And these beaded works, they're all circles, um, taking a look at the, the petri trays. They're, they're the, um, the molecule, mole each one represents a molecule of one disease. And all of them, save one, are done with little glass beads, epitomizing the trade of glass beads as, as, as Europeans moved west. The one that isn't done with beads is syphilis, the one disease that was here pre-contact. And she did this with porcupine quills, which she dyed with natural materials. So she went back to the natural materials to do it. And when I was talking to her about these, I said, have you? And before I said another word, she said, yep, I'll send it to you. And she sent me the one she did on COVID-19. And she sent, she sent, she sent the, the piece itself, and then she did some on, on her own mask, which is a hoot, um, that she could see exactly where I was coming from. In Saskatchewan as well, Bob Boyer, who uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, his blanket paintings, uh, gave us really vivid and visceral commentaries on First Peoples history in Canada, and he was address addressing colonialism environmental destruction, and indigenous culture, and calling out injustice betrayals, and cultural and political defeats. And I have to say, this is long before most of society in Canada had any idea of the depth and the scope and the horrors of some of these, these, um, uh, these issues. And that's why I really, uh, we, that's why I really um, uh, 
feel these works are so important. He visually overlays and intersects indigenous and non-indigenous visual traditions. You can see geometric abstraction, you can see the Union Jack, and yet you can see the, the, his um, uh, indigenous colors, indigenous patterning, um, uh, which together add to the depth and poignancy of his message. And it certainly set the stage for 21st century reconciliation. We brought him here. Uh, I guess in the years I was, I was uh, chair of the Canadian Art Museum Directors Organization. And um, we also managed to get Canada's Art Museum Directors up to Alert Bay, which I think was one of the most important tours um, I've ever been part of. And that would have been about 1989. But in this work, um, uh, Minor Sport in Canada, and I ate, uh, this title is A Minor Sport in Canada, uh, uh, 1980 and done in 1985, recalls the 1885 Battle of Batoche. The Union Jack morphing, as I said, into traditional motifs of Plains Indigenous people, symbolizing the British attitude as they rode into Batoche, culminating in the Northwest Rebellion led by Louis Riel and Gabriel Dumont. Red blotches of paint for him symbolize the First Nations blood that was shed. And Boyer noted, quote, that his use of geometric designs reflects his personal experiences, social issues, and spirituality, end quote. In 1992, he insisted a caption be posted in an exhibition, and it read, I don't consider myself political. I'm just very socially aware, which is different. If I were politically aware, I'd be afraid of some of the things I would do, end quote. Now you all will have, oh, and there's, a, there's another of his blanket pieces. These are, these are done on canvas and you, you tack them onto the wall. They're not stretched, they're not framed. And here you can see the, the, the uh, traditional, uh, re the repetition of some of the traditional um, forms and, and images. There was a really upsetting Im uh, article um, a few years back uh, that uh, didn't pay um, very positive uh, comments to my city of Winnipeg, calling Winnipeg the most racial, uh, the, the most um, uh, racial city in the, in, the, in the country. And indigenous artist Casey Adams um, decided right away she was going to deal with this racism. So she got on social media and invited First Nations uh, people to um, uh, be photographed by her. She's a photograph artist. Well, she is a photograph artist, but she works in multimedia too. Uh, so Casey uh, got a number of people, and she said, I'm going to take two photographs of you. In the first one, on the left, she said, I want you to look how you feel when people say the most disparaging things they say to you, and I want to know what those words are. So the image on the left is that with what people have perceived this person was. On the right, she said, I want you to smile and think about all your accomplishments. And that's what we have uh, on, on the right-hand side. So she did a number of these pairs, and they were not shown in a gallery purposefully. They were shown outside. They were shown on bus shelters. They were shown on billboards. And the idea was to take this out into the streets where people have all these mis misnomers. Um, and she said, one strength of this work is that it doesn't point fingers at people. It emphasizes the injustice toward the original people of this land. It gives a voice to the participants and shows the audience that they are staring into the eyes of human beings that deserve respect. My intent was to com combat racism and present First Nations, Métis, and individ in Inuit people in ways they see themselves. I expected some back backlash, she said, but instead I got nothing but support. A year later, the um, uh, article had quite a different turn. Water, right to water, is another prominent subject in the work of Western Canadian artists, and another subject that if the artists hadn't brought it to our attention, I think it would be uh, dealt with even more slowly than it has been. Tanya Harnett of Saskatchewan's Carry the Kettle First Nation, and she teaches at the University of Alberta. I had dinner with her the other night. Her series, Scarred, Sacred Waters of 2014, brings to attention the contaminated water on the First Nations reserves before her, near her. But Robert Houle, member of Manitoba's Sandy Bay First Nation, who lives and works in, in, in Ontario, 
um, has addressed many, many issues of history and culture in Canada's First Nations. And he created in 2018 his water series in direct response to the drinking water crisis. In Mishupeshu and Water Spirit, Mishupeshu, the shaman, divines for water, his red lightning rod penetrating the large white mountain, or is it a cloud, in the foreground. The yellow background with Hool's characteristic drips of paint on the left edge forms half the competition, co composition and enhances Mishupeshu's mythical role. His form for Mishupeshu is an amalgam of a number of animals, here with the horns of a bison, an animal central in the lives and myths of ind indigenous cultures. Mishupeshu, the central underwater creature for the Ojibwe, is considered as the protector for some and a danger for others. And he wanted to make it very clear when I talked to him about this work that he wanted this work to show both. But in this work, he's also using Mishupeshu's healing powers to interact with the spirit world through ritual and divination, emanating a powerful depth. And I'm intrigued that, in, in, that Marianne Nicholson worked in glass to get her sense of the issues of water. And she's etched glass, the glass being in the shape of, of um, uh, killer whale dorsal fins. I'm going to come back to Rebecca Belmore for a minute. Her issues that she's portrayed for all of us to listen to and to read and see, and I truly believe that we need to listen to the work of our artists, not just quickly look at it. Um, at the turn of the millennium, she um, did a video called The Named and the Unnamed, and a number of, and, and this is a detail from that, uh, and this, of course, drew attention to another devastating Canadian social matter, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. One of the events that she, um, not events, one of, the, one of the performance pieces she did, she did in a gravel parking lot in the Exchange District in Winnipeg at night. The only light came from the headlights of an old car. And she had a, um, a music playing from the, from the car on an old recording device. And we all gathered on that uh, parking lot. She spoke. And the words were both moving and heart-rending. She'd installed mesh on the side of a brick building, one of the heritage brick buildings in the Exchange District. And she gave us all a rose and a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper, we were to write the name of somebody who was murdered or missing or whom we lost, a woman. And we tied our pieces of paper to our roses. And the roses were put on that mesh. She had a, a sort of equipment to take it to the top. So when the piece was finished, it was absolutely beautiful, this heritage brick wall covered with roses. But I'll tell you, it was an impassioned happening that preceded the inquiry of murdered and missing women for many, many years. And uh, I was thrilled to meet your chancellor at uh, a dinner in Ottawa earlier this year. And uh, she, of course, was the chair of the inquiry on murdered and missing women. Uh, Métis artist Jamie Black's Red Dress Project, and, and, and Sheila, thanks for the photographs in the, in, in the background. Artist Sheila Spence is, is with us today. Um, this, this project was initially presented in 2015, and it's grown to be an annual installation honoring missing and murdered women. It's now global. You go anywhere in the world, and you will see red dresses hanging on trees and windows, on fences, in public and in private spaces. And these red dresses symbolize the women who might have worn them. Beginning as Jamie Black's expression of her own grief and overwhelming connectedness with this women, with these missing women, she said, quote, I hope to draw attention to the gendered and racialized nature of violent crimes against Aboriginal women and to evoke a presence through the marking of absence. Now, I'm not sure I'm right in showing you um, Faye Heavy Shield's clairvoyant work. I call it a clairvoyant work, Sisters, uh, which she did in 1985. 
the six pairs of gold high-heeled shoes with the toes pointing out. This represents Heavy Shield and her five sisters coming together, shielding each other, the circle of shoes symbolizing the strength of women. I know this piece was not initially done to call attention to the situation of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, but it certainly emphasizes the need of circles of protection for women, circles representing the cycle of life, the spirit, and the universe, connecting the connections between family, family solidarity, feminism, and missing and murdered women and girls, and that cannot be ignored. I have discussed this particular work on the chamber floor a number of times. Oh, I guess I'm in the wrong, I moved along here. Um, uh, this piece of, um, of uh, Terence Hool, I find um, particularly interesting. Uh, he uh, did this, it, it's, um, uh, it's a piece that he did for Massachusetts for the O Canada show. And it is a decal on the wall of a bison, as you can see. And um, it's, um, <clears throat> he has the sense of oil dripping down. And in the installation in, in Massachusetts, in, in, in Mass Mocha, he had five little canisters representing the oil cans that, you know, when we change the oil in our car. He did a color version and he did a black and white version. And he asked me which one I wanted in the book. And I said, no, you tell me which one you want in the book. You're the one who, um, you're the one who uh, has done the work. And he said, I want the black and white, which I think is much more appropriate. And as he told me, he said, you know, the bison were taken from us. We had to learn, without, learn to live without the bison. They provided, as I said, our food, our tools, our, our warmth, our clothing. Uh, and, he said, nah, and he said, we managed. We found another way of survival. Now we all are going to have to learn without being dependent on, on oil. Other artists have done a lot to bring, other indigenous artists have done a lot to bring histories to the fore in both blunt ways and do, done so unequivocally. Kent Monkman, Robert Houle, Dana Claxton, and Lawrence Paul Waxwell Upton have all done work focusing on post-colonialism, self-rule and, um, uh, self, self and sovereignty. Dana Claxton, express the situation really straightforwardly, a situation she dubbed as structurally dehumanized all facets of life in North America. My work has attempted to show us as human beings. Her work connects to her ancestors. She talks a lot about her spirit ancestors, ways of knowing, and her Lakota teachings. They're multimedia, multisensorial. She does video, installation, and performance. And this video, Buffalo Bone China, that she did in 1997, underscores the importance of the buffalo. And you can see the theme of the buffalo coming through, the bison coming through a number of my images. And she's here illuminating the buffalo's spiritual and physical significance on indigenous plains cultures. In the video, she smashes pieces of bone china and makes four bundles of them, which you can see more clearly perhaps in the right version of, the, of it. Um, and uh, the bundles of shards are arranged in a circle a sacred formation in Lakota culture, symbolizing the cycle of life, the sun, the moon, the earth, and the universe. And she said, the breaking of China refers to the exploitation and decimation of the buffalo. But we all know that the British and Europeans brought their china, their bone china cups and saucers and plates to Canada. And in this work, she therefore is incorporating these marks as her reference to colonial history. Nationally and internationally acclaimed Kent Monkman, Winnipeg artist uh, who's moved back to Winnipeg, um, has done a lot of work in his Urban Res series set in Winnipeg's North End. And his characters go through this whole series. Miss Chief tells the stories of lost dignities, rights, and self. And I don't know if any of you saw the exhibition that was touring Canada of Kent's work. It was at the Winnipeg Art Gallery a year or so ago and, and, and was really powerful. It's, it's, it's got a humorous side, 
But throughout it all, he's drawing from works, he knows Western Canadian art history extremely well, and he overlays that with the um, uh, story of, of uh, Indigenous history, and his goal was, in his words, fighting for the change in culture, the art and politicians on the front line, and trying to change how the country represents Indigenous people to become the point of strong hope. And I think it's really, it, 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 it's important to realize uh, that tough as some of these images are and tough as some of these messages are, they all come with a sense of hope in the reality, hope in the way they express it, hope in the message they're expressing, and hope in the way that we're going to be listening to it. Uh, BC's Lawrence Paul uh, Yexwell Upton uh, likewise elucidates the harm and lack of rights and issues in his works. And um, I love the way he incorporates the landscape. And if I'd shown you more of, of, um, of uh, um, George Swinton's work, uh, it, I, I love the way uh, he treats the sun and his treatment of yellow in many of the same ways. Again, putting hope and light and, 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 and the spirit. And you can see, obviously, his tradition, traditional symbols. You can see the stylized trees here. And you can see the figures. And in this one, you can see the um, uh, um, almost skeleton-like uh, figure on the right-hand side and, and the killer whale rising out of the, out of the water. He uses his, his native Coast Salish imagery. Um, and uh, again, is looking at the reality of the subjugation of First Nations at the hands of European, while also underlining the strength and power of indigenous peoples. And uh, I think um, while politics is at the heart of his art, he makes it very clear that he is going to borrow, use all these symbols um, of both Western and non-Western um, art history, he, feelize, he, he realizes that his, his unique stylistic, stylistic approaches and his strong colors enhance his message. And uh, I think these are, are truly important paintings. And I was delighted to see a show of his work at Canada House uh, in London um, a few years ago. And, and I guess if I take a look at what I want to do going forward, I want to get more Canadian artists with their work in, in um, Canada House. Uh, there are other attitudes and concerns and realities that come out of colonialism that I think we have to be aware of, that artists are, are generous enough to uh, uh, portray for us in almost a, um, a very personal, private way, one being a Métis artist, Rosalie Fable, um, and uh, she was uh, uh, adopted into a non-Indigenous family. And uh, in this work on the left, a simulation, she first did it as assimilation, and then she decided, no, she wanted to change it to a simulation. Uh, this is a, she used a lot of images from her family photograph albums. And this was her birthday picture against the white picket fence with the flowers and the dress. And uh, it was years later, going over that um, photograph album, that she realized why she felt different. She didn't realize it when she was six years old. Um, and uh, since then, she's really been trying to, to, to um, come to grips with her culture, understand it, and she's done it in an amazing way. She's got a great sense of humor, and, and uh, um, uh, I think her work is, is really strong. And in the work on the left, I awoke to find my spirit return. She's obviously going back to Louis Riel's statement, my people will sleep for a hundred years, but when they awake, it will be the artists who give them their spirit back. And here she is in, with Louis Riel looking through the door. This is the Riel House, a historic site on, uh, on uh, the Red River in, in Winnipeg. And uh, you see her wrapped in the, in the uh, Hudson's Bay blanket. And you see historic figures and his family figures uh, in the background. Wab Canoe, by the way, our new, um, on, our new premier, is seeking to declare uh, Louis Riel Manitoba's honorary, pre, uh, um, honorary premier. A young artist uh, from um, Yukon, a recipient of the Sobe Award a few years ago, uh, Joseph Tisica, uh, in this painting, With Friends, also refers to the 60s scoop. 
Um, and uh, he, this is a personal story of his mother. And I'm going to quote him. The reality of it, meaning 60s scoop, seemed absurd. Just a sec, got to get the right page here. Seemed absurd and impossible that a man of no familiarity could go into another's house, abduct the children, and escort them to an unknown and horrifying future, like some perverse Pied Piper. And this painting shows the man at the door. You see the police car. Uh, you see the child hiding in a tent made out of a Hudson's Bay blanket. The big issue, though, that ties so many of these issues together, uh, whether it be racism, poverty, homelessness, are the residential schools, which span generations. And uh, I want to admit that I think they were a long and truly black mark in Canada's history, obliterating culture and language and a sense of self-worth, which I hope um, uh, subsequent generations of Indigenous peoples across this country can regain. Uh, in the 1980s, when I was director of the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, New Chalneth and Coast Salish artist Art Thompson uh, told me his story of the Port Alberni Residential School in, in, in um, great detail. And I'll tell you, that afternoon we spent in my office, I, as I say to people, I don't know how many boxes of Kleenex we went through. That story haunts me as vividly now as it did those days ago. And I have to say that Art was one of the early and per people to come out and, and tell his story. And he did it articulately. He did it with warmth. He did it with compassion. I will be forever sorry that Art died of cancer before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was constituted. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't have a good enough slide to show you, image to show you here. But I am going to say, his work delves into his Northwest Coast iconography and often includes a circle, a circle reflecting the circle of life, the culture, the, the spirit, and of humanity. His circles are filled with rhythms, and his work is often filled with animals. And I have to ask the question, and I do, especially when I'm showing his works to kids, are the rhythms and movements in his circles looking forward to reconciliation, or are they looking backwards to memory? Or are they doing both? Well, while the schools were still operating and predating the establishment of the Truth Reconciliation Commission by 19 years, Joan Cardinal Schubert did the lesson. And I'm sure some of you saw it. We, we showed it at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria back in the late 80s. As I said, about 19 years before the Truth and Reconciliation was, Commission was set up. And I think the lesson was a very remarkable and compelling exhibition. As you can see, it was set up as a schoolroom it had a chalkboard on its two walls, one with an oppressive liturgy written on it, the other being a poignant memory wall on which visitors were invited to add their memories. And I'm going to say right now, I've got the wrong date on here for this particular installation. The date is when we showed it. This image is from a later one, as one of the artists I've met with in the last couple of days said, by the way, Pat, this one on the memory wall talks about the TRC, and the TRC wasn't there. And not in, in 89, so you can see how this work grew. Um, you see the black classroom chairs in tethered rows, portraying the rigid system of power. A dunce's cap is on the stool at the back, and a red apple is skewered to each seat, which during the exhibition turned brown and turned rotten. Being brutally honest, this installation embraces and exposes the truth and reaffirms the power of the human spirit. She and I were going to work on a project together, and which would end up in a book on her work. And I will be forever sorry that she passed away before we had a chance to do that, that project. But Robert Houle's large painting, Sandy Bay, from 1998-99, is, in my view, one of the most significant works in Canadian art. In 2000, he told the Winnipeg Art Gallery staff how his parents were forced to send him and his siblings to Sandy Bay Residential School. His sisters had to go through one door, and he another. And after entering the school, the brothers were banned from seeing their sisters. Their recesses were at different times. They were in different classes, and they lived in different parts of the building. And if you look at the centerpiece of this, this piece, you'll see there are no doors for anybody to get out of. You'll see the windows are veiled. And each window represents one of his siblings. And he buried his feelings behind that veil over the front of the school building. 
And I was really impressed as he, as he talked to our staff, the way he contained himself. In painting it, his raw emotions are in the right-hand panel of this work, and the two photographs on the left-hand side, one represents a priest who had been very nice to him, and the other his sister's confirmation photograph. His composure about it all, though, broke. His composure broke with the TRC. He went back to Sandy Bay for a family funeral, and he woke up with a dream, and a dream that the traumatic experience came out and what he'd buried and had forgotten all came out. And so he got back to Toronto and did 24 really powerful oil stick drawings, one every day for a month, each recalling his time at Sandy Bay Residential School, the dormitory, the playground, the religious figures. And some of these drawings bear inscriptions like night predator, pretending to pray, outhouse abuse, and on it went. And he said, I didn't know what it was with that dream, but I knew something terribly wrong had happened to me. It was a trip back home to Sandy Bay for a funeral that finally triggered specific memories. I had a horrible, vivid dream, he told me, about an incident that had happened to me that I had completely forgotten. So I went back to Toronto two days later and decided once and for all I was going to deal with this. Through creating his residential school series, he built his bridge. He said he's come to terms with it, but the scar is irreparable, and neither he nor his family will ever forget what happened. I contend coming out of all of this that society now needs to build its bridge. George Littlechild was also a member of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and he brought his feelings forward through painting uh, with sort of his images of animals. Joan Ash Poitras, internationally lauded First Nations painter and collage art artist and printmaker, um, in her work, her canvases are absolutely chock-a-block full. There's not one iota of uncovered space on her canvases. She tells Indigenous history. And honestly, many of, his were, and when, many of her works are really unsettling for those who don't know that history. Her images are divided into segments, telling multiple stories, multiple, each one telling multiple stories, multiple situations, covering multiple time frames, past and present. And she often includes personal photographs, or the ephemera, as she calls it. Her ephemera includes collage clippings, photographs, sometimes a stamp, usually in letters of the alphabet or words, and often a reference to Hudson's Bay Company with the characteristic stripes of, 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 of the blankets. She, though, emphatically, and I've had wonderful conversations with her, she emphatically and righteous, rightly recognizes that art is a healing process and a sacred act. And her paintings hold hope for the future. And when we had that conversation, I said, so the making of art is a healing process, right? And she said, yes. And I said, the looking at art has to be a healing process, too, to which she agreed. So I phoned her the day the, 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 the awful finding uh, at, in Kamloops. And I said, how are you? I also wrote Robert Houle that day saying, how are you? And she said, you know, she said, we'd known that bodies were buried on all these sites for many, many years. And I've depicted bones in many of my works over many years. Carrie, I want to thank you for giving me this image this morning. We, Carrie was, uh, Newman was part of a conversation we had about uh, indigenous uh, uh, artists and, and uh, indigenous expression and, and uh, what we all need to do next. And uh, this witness blanket uh, is in the uh, Canadian Museum for Human Rights where I'm speaking, I think, at 9 o'clock on Tuesday morning. And... Uh, I'm going to take another look at it. I've seen it up in Whitehorse. I've seen it several places, and, and uh, uh, I'm um, uh, going to take another look. And Carrie pointed out to me this morning that the image over the door is a painting that Art Thompson did as a student at the Port Alberni Residential School. And you said uh, you were allowed to use it. The family gave um, full rights for you to use it. So I want to thank you for that. 
Uh, just be just before I, I close, I, I want to um, show you this work by Val Bint, the artist and knowledge keeper who hosted that First uh, Nations Prairie uh, focus group for me. Uh, this uh, major work of hers was unveiled. It's a piece of public art outdoors at the Forks in Winnipeg, and it's entitled Education is the New Bison. And like so many of these other pieces we've seen, tie the past, the peasant, and the future together. This is made of steel books and films by indigenous authors and filmmakers, with a few included by people she terms as our allies, the allies of indigenous people. And when you walk around this piece and stop and look at it, and anybody who comes to visit me in Winnipeg, I'm going to take you there, uh, you'll be, it re it's really telling how many there are and how far back some of this goes. And um, there are three that are open, one on each side, you can't see the other side, and one at the end. And they're open with a quote from each of those three people. One is Louis Riel with the quote I just made, gave you. The other is Murray Sinclair, which his quote was, education got us into this mess and education will get us out of it. And Robert Davidson, a quote in which he talks about the importance of tradition and that tradition is the future. The bison here faces across the river, across the forks, across the Assiniboine River, to the gravesite of her father. She planted the gravesite of her, her, gra her grandfather, sorry. She, she um, planted the gravesite of her grandfather with natural grasses and, and, and plants. She did the same around the bison. Sage grass, berries, and uh, she has the bison looking forward. We uh, sat beside the bison. Well, we've sat beside the bison a number of times, she and I, and had conversations. So she wrote me one day, she said, Pat, the thing I would like to say about education is the new bison is what happens in its presence. People begin meaningful conversations around him. Conversation is critical in any healing work. When people talk to each other, they usually see each other's eyes and are no longer the other. When there is no other, it changes how we see each other, how we think of each other. We soon discover that no one, nobody is the other. We are all the same. We are all related. There are many other aspects of indigenous art that uh, uh, I would love to talk about. Uh, I think time is too short to, to, to go on with, with, with more. I'm going to show you a, a few images. Brian Jungen's wonderful pieces where he's using these objects that uh, we covet, right? We all buy the newest running shoes and whatever all. And the way he's taken them and turned them into uh, traditional um, uh, symbols, I think is amazing. And then we get Robert Davidson, and I love his um, supernatural eye. I think in the book I have a red version of it. Uh, this version is one that is in the uh, National Gallery of Canada. And very simple, very simple, traditional form, abstracted into to, to, um, truly contemporary sculpture. And I think it talks about what Val was saying about looking into each other's eye and, and, and there is no other, we're, we're all the same. Um, Richard Hunt, uh, with his, um, uh, with, with, with his um, uh, mask and uh, his bronze sculpture, the Klingit chief, in both these, He's recalling his ancestors. And I'm really intrigued, and I think it's very healthy, really rich, that, that how important one's ancestors are and how those ancestors carry to the future. I'm not sure that many, that some non-Indigenous cultures have that. It's too much about the me and the now instead of the building and the building to the future. Uh, uh, in terms of relationships. And as a society, we're not going to be able to go anywhere without those relationships. And so I think that's, that's uh, critically important. 
And I think uh, Arthur Vickers, with his intangible heritage, has done exactly the same. This tells the story of all his ancestors and the looking of the eye to the future. It's very, very positive. And yes, in recognizing the, 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 the ills of our past, I think uh, to recognize them in a way with a positive step to the future is the way that we are going to come together uh, uh, with strength. Tim Paul, when we commissioned this poll, um, uh, those of you who were on the acquisitions committee of the way at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria at the time will remember we, we got money from Canada Council to commission this work. This is a long time ago. Um, and uh, uh, we, um, he said, what do you want me to do? I said, you're the artist. He met with the acquisitions committee, I think three times. And uh, he said, well, I, I'll get my people's permission. I said, look, this is, this is the money we have. We want a poll. You create it. So he went back to his, 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 his uh, elders. And one side is traditional. The other is much more contemporary, honoring Mother Moon. And we have Bill Reed, who's going back to history in his public piece that's both in the Vancouver airport and the, the Canadian embassy. And we have Christy Belcourt on the left. This is the stained glass window that was commissioned for Parliament Hill. It's in center block on Parliament Hill. <coughs> Parliament Hill. And uh, it talks about um, um, uh, the residential schools and the th uh, their three parts. And it goes from the pre-contact to the very difficult horror-filled horror times to a more positive future. And I think on that I'm going to um, close by saying Canada has certainly hit its painful lows at various points in our history, racism and residential schools being particularly dark chapters. But visual artists are telling us those truths they're telling them plainly, honestly, many in heart-rending situations, but I'm very touched by the, how these images come through to us with compassion and with a very real hope for the future, and they're healing and inspiring, and that, that goes for um, uh, Carrie's um, uh, blanket as well. I think it's, it's, it's it, the way it incorporates past and looks to the future. Illuminating searing, ga searing gaps in justice and inequality and the destruction of place and people, artists are providing constructive ways for communities and our nations to be a better place. My um, second husband who died a number of years ago had a motto which was, we are all better off when we are all better off. And I believe these works are making us all better off. But I ask, say that with a question, a question to all of us that I say a lot. Is society really listening to these works? Is society really understanding these works and responding to these clarion calls for real change? I hope so. And I'm encouraged in many ways, disappointed in others, but as, as Murray said, it uh, took us generations to get into this, and it'll take generations to get out of it. So I think we have to understand it step by step. Art in its complexity does reveal our truths as to who we are, where we live, and how we adapt. Visual art is a pillar of culture, all cultures, transcending geography, time, age, and words. Art is essential in order to understand and address these issues fairly and openly. The core of any reconciliations leading to reconciliation must be the understanding of culture. And place is the deep root of understanding that culture. And I believe everyone, everyone has to be at the table of reconciliation if we're to move forward constructively as a society. So I want to close with a quote from a non-Indigenous artist, that being none other than Maxwell Bates. This Alberta and British Columbia artist, expressionist figure painter, who was one of the founders of, the, of, the, of Victoria's Limner Society. As you know, he was a prisoner, German prisoner of war for much of World War II. And throughout his four plus years as a prisoner of war, uh, he 
did forced labor in the salt mines. He kept a journal. And he noted the demeanors and changing physiques of his fellow prisoners. And those changing physiques of his fellow prisoners is clearly evident throughout his work, whether it be his depictions of prairie people during the, uh, 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 during the Depression, uh, whether it be his series on workers, or whether it be it's, it's his works that really shows the dichotomy in, 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 in society. And those works in haunting him also fed his themes of clowns and beggars. So in 1962, he wrote a book called Far Away Flags. I am an artist who for 40 years has stood at the lake edge, throwing stones in the lake. Sometimes very faintly, I hear a splash. I believe his splash was far greater than he realized. I also hope that the collective splash of the artists I've shown you this afternoon, and as I said, there are many more I could have if time had permitted, I hope they are creating positive pathways to reconciliation. Indigenous artists in Canada are unquestionably, in my view, leading international change for Indigenous people in many parts of the world. Wearing my hat as a member of the Senate of Canada, I had the opportunity to meet with politicians and people from globally, and they all are well aware of the crises we're facing, but they're all really amazed at the honesty in the way that we're facing up to it and trying to, to build more positive futures. So I want to close by saying it is artists, and especially our Western Canadian artists, who tell us so poignantly through their visual voices who we are, what we must cherish, and what we must address as a society. We all must listen and act with small or large reconciliation actions, and together we will create real reconciliation. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for this opportunity. And um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Anybody have any questions? Well, then I'm going to say thank you very much. And Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was my biggest challenge in the Senate? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, it's an unfinished challenge. My biggest challenge in this, as, a, as a first art historian or museologist to be appointed to the Senate, the Prime Minister, when he called me to say he wanted me in the Senate, he said, Pat, you will work on everything. You do not have to vote with us. But I want you to do everything through the lens of arts and culture. That's what I did. I got into the Senate and nobody knew what to do with me because I came from this background they'd never seen before, right? And two weeks into the job, um, as I was telling, telling you at lunch today, two weeks into the job, a senator came up to me, a senator who will remain nameless, said, uh, I don't know why you're here. You don't, you don't have the background. You don't have the credentials to be here. You're, 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 you're not a bag man. And I said, no, not a bag man. And I didn't answer him. Two weeks later, I went up to him and I said, you know, I've been thinking about your question. I've spent my whole professional life doing my best to give voice to multiple issues, multiple societal issues, from multiple perspectives, for multiple audiences all of the time. That's what we do in the Senate. In my gallery world, we did it visually. In the Senate world, we do it verbally. And I said, so... Quite honestly, I think I'm the best qualified person to be in the Senate. With that, over time, we became friends. When I left the Senate, when I got into the Senate, nobody, as I said, knew what to do with the arts. When I left the Senate, I can honestly tell you, I had supporters for the arts from every political stripe, both in the House of Commons and in the Senate. So my visual artist laureate bill is now through second reading. It's, it's, it was passed the Senate unanimously three times. It got dumped in the House of Commons twice, once because of prorogation and once because of an election. It's now being passed, the second reading in the House of Commons has been to committee, and I'm told third reading is going to be on the 29th of January. I have an uphill battle, so I'm not finished in a way, right? 
because uh, there was an amendment put in that I was only told about the other day that they wanted to con it to include AI. And I'm saying no, AI shouldn't be in a parliamentary lori uh, visual laureate bill. It should be in the Copyright Act and many other pieces of legislation. So I gotta fight that battle. Um, my greatest disappointment is that my declaration uh, uh, respecting the essential role of artists and creative expression in Canada uh, has died. It got through the Senate unanimously. Uh, Jim Carr was its House of Commons sponsor. Jim was doing a great job with it. But as you all know, Jim Carr died just about a year ago. And for um, to get another sponsor, you have to have unanimous consent in the House of Commons. And there was one vote against unanimous consent, even though I had people from every party wanting to be the, 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 the sponsor. And I have to tell you, um, it was the minister that was the dissenting voice. Two weeks before I had to retire, you have to retire from the Senate at 75. Two weeks before I turned 75, he said, I really admire the intent of your bill, but I don't like the words access for all. So there's my challenge, not finished. So as I talk across the country, I'm as asking young people, artists, everybody to stand up and get this bill back in the next house. I've spoken to Jim's son, who now has the seat. I'm continuing to speak to, to artists, uh, to, to, to politicians, um, and uh, we're gonna get it back. I did consultations with artists and arts workers and from teenagers to nonagenarians in every discipline as I developed that bill and was told that no bills come to either house with so much prior consultation. So I'm disappointed, but this old girl doesn't give up. Anything else? Well, I'm going to say thank you very, very much. And um, uh, we shall see some of you again, I'm sure. Thanks. Thanks.